So let's get started. Uh, running just a few seconds late. I like starting on time. I like ending on time. So let's kind of dive into things. I was thinking about um, I was thinking about what I wanted to go over today. And you know, it's always about obje advanced objection handling. And I had an aha moment. The aha moment isn't about that all the same objections keep coming up. 90% of the time, you're going to get the same objections that I get, right? If you're calling a seller, if you're calling expired listing or for sale by owner, somebody looking in real estate, uh, they're going to be the same objections. So today, uh, I want to walk, walk you guys through a technique that's called deflection. Some of you have heard me uh, talk about that before. Uh, but before we get into that, I do want to kind of just really touch base on the fundamentals of objection handling, uh, uh, the fundamentals of just sales fundamentals as I see it. So we're going to go ahead and just hammer through those real quick. I always start off the day with that for those of you that are, that are new to the group. So number one, you can make up in skill what you lack in numbers. I was talking to my daughter this morning. I drop her off at school every morning. So that's why Tuesdays and Thursdays, sometimes I, I could be running just a, a little bit late because I'm, I'm very time blocked. Um, but there are some unknown things when you're dealing with a third grader. But uh, I was talking to her and I shared with her a story like when I was in the third grade, the teacher said that only one person could uh, do their handwriting in cursive. And so I've always been very competitive since a young age. And so I didn't like that. And I remember that to this day. The guy's name was Chad Hansen. I still remember that. And I was mad that I was not someone who had that penmanship that the teacher, you know, highlighted. So I started practicing and I started handing in my, my, uh, my, my lesson plans, both in cursive and in print. So I was talking to her and I share the same thing with everyone is that you make up in skill where you uh, lack in numbers and coming up to the other one, the only way you can get better is through practice. So practice makes perfect. Uh, number two, the person who asks the questions controls the conversation. 100% of the time, everything that I do is question-based. Telling is not selling. So when you're talking to people, the key here is you have to ask questions. You have to ask questions and able to solve a problem. The bigger problem you solve, the more money you make. Number three is you cannot change a person's perception or belief, only they can't. I was talking to another agent yesterday in regards to uh, politics. And I knew for a fact that no matter what I said was going to change their person uh, belief or perception, nor did I try, right? Religion, politics, I don't touch those things at all. But uh, the only way that you can actually get into it is by asking questions. And even then, I mean, depending on the subject, you might not want to open up that can of worms. You don't have a lead until you know their why and their when. Well, you don't have a prospect until you know that they own a home and they, they live in your market area and they want to sell it. Once you identify that they're a valid prospect, now you start diving into questions about their why and their when. Their why being their motivation, their when is the gauge of how serious they are. You know, if you have someone that wants to sell their home just for the sake of selling their home, um, and they said that they'll they'll sell it when they get what they want out of it, but yet they don't know what they want out of it. And you know, this is like real conversations that people have, right? They talk to sellers. And they're like, yeah, I want to sell my home. Okay, why do you want to sell your home? Well, I just want to, if I can get my price, I'll, I'll sell it. But if I don't, I'll just live here till I die. And people will actually take those listings. The truth of the matter is when you take a listing like that, the odds are more in the favor that you're not going to sell it until they die than when they actually get the property, the price that they want. Because the price that they want is always going to be more than what the property is worth significantly. So... Uh, you don't have a lead until you know their why and their when. When in doubt, mirror their objection as a question. Uh, when in doubt, you should do that anyways, but you can also deliberately do that. Um, what is this? Number six, you'll never get any better without practice. I just shared my daughter's, uh, my, my story I share with my daughter. Uh, you don't get good without practice on anything. Natural ability will only take you so far. There are people who are blessed with a personality that can actually be a public speaker that can actually train, that can actually are, is very good on the phone, but natural ability is only going to take you so far, right? You got to practice if you want to get better. Uh, every, everyone makes time for things that are important. 
everyone makes time for things that are important. You don't got time to role play. That means something else was more important. You know, you don't got time to prospect. That means something else was more important, right? You don't got time, you know, wake up early in the morning. That's what I do. I, I woke up at just after four this morning. I don't normally, I didn't normally wake up at five because that's the time that I make time to do a lot of the stuff that I know that I don't have time during the day. My day is all about prospecting, lead follow-up appointments and retention with agents, right? That's, that's my day in the leadership role that I have. As an agent, your job should be hunting. It should be going out there looking for, for deals. That should be 80% of your time. 20% of that should be servicing your deals. Everything else you got to make time for, right? Family comes first in my, in my law of books. So that goes in my calendar first. But, you know, with me, nine to five is work time. That's go time for me. So that's it. That's it for, for, for the fundamentals. Let's hammer through some of these things. We're going to talk about deflection. Now, what is deflection? Deflection is bouncing something off the wall, right? You see somebody that you want to hit, and instead of just taking it and throwing it at them and hitting them right in the face, you're going to take it, you're going to bounce it off the wall, and it's going to hit them, okay? That's deflection. It's the best way I can explain it. So what we're going to do is when we deal with an objection, instead of going directly at the person, we're going to deflect it. Now, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, right? Could be a two-on-one -on -one conversation. And, and I'll, you'll, you'll see what I mean here in a second. But instead of going really, really direct, which could turn a lot of personalities off, you know, when people are really short and direct and to the point, you could, could offend somebody. Some people appreciate that, but that's like, at best case scenario, 25% of the people that you're going to be talking to. It's four types of personalities. The people who are, who are uh, direct are 25% of the population because that's one, one fourth. But anyways, we're going to bounce it off the wall. So the first objection we're going to go over is, uh, now I'm taking these objections off the people who signed up for next week. So these are going to be the objections that we're going to be practicing next week in the group. We haven't decided on if we're going to sell the home or not. We haven't decided if we're going to sell our home or not. Now, uh, if this came up to me, number one, this should not happen at the kitchen table. Okay. This should happen before you get to the kitchen table. This should be an objection probably in your first one or two calls, probably on your first call, right? We haven't decided on if we're going to uh, sell or not. And this could be a condition. This could also be a blow off, right? So here's what I talk about deflection. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, most homeowners want to make sure that they're making the right decision before they sell the home. Is that like you? Okay. Most homeowners is deflection. Look, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but I'm saying most homeowners. So now in their mind, I just bunched them up with a group of people and it's really acknowledging and making them right and making them normal, right? Hey, I get it. You know, most homeowners want to make sure that they're making the right decision before the, they decide to sell their home. Now, if you don't mind me asking, okay, that's called a softener. We'll do that probably more in depth a little bit, bit, a little bit more. If you don't mind me asking, what would be the deciding factor on whether or not you would sell your home or not? I mean, that's a legitimate question. If you were talking to your friend, if you were talking to a family member and they said, you know, we haven't really decided on if we're going to sell or not, you're not going to go blank right? You're not going to like be at a loss for words. The only reason why you're lost for words is because a lot of people are uncomfortable talking to people who they don't know. And, but if you know that your goal is to find out the next thing is there, look, they, if you're talking to this person, they own a home, they live in your area, they might want to sell it, right? That's the conversation that you're having. And then the next question is why, right? But, but to get that, you have to solve the first problem. What is the deciding factor on whether or not you're going to sell the home or not? Okay. It might be the market. It might, it might show you what the next objection is. It might show you what the next condition is. It might be one of the most popular objections on right now on planet earth, which is we want to wait until spring used to be until we wanted to wait until after, after the elections, but now all the objections are waiting until after spring or wait until after COVID. So, um, so that's how I'd rebuttal that one. Right. You know what? Most homeowners, they want to make sure that they're making the right decision before they sell their home. If you don't mind me asking, um, what is the deciding factor of, of you selling or not selling? And then let them, let them answer the question, right? So that's number one. 
Number two, never heard this one before. We're going to wait until spring. Okay. So, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you know, a lot of homeowners have decided to put things on hold. See, a lot of homeowners. Look, I totally get what you're doing. In fact, most homeowners or a lot of homeowners have decided to take their home off the market until next spring. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but did you know that there are 32% fewer homes on the market right now than there were a year ago? Did you know that? Well, no, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, this is why it's a crazy market. You see, you have interest rates that are below 3% that is pushing, you know, that is, that is really pushing the demand, right? And because we have an unusual amount of low supply on the market, right, that, that's what's making up the frenzied buying season, right? We know that. So, Mr. and Ms. Siller, what do you think would have happened if interest rates started to rise at the same time that all these other sellers decided to come onto the market? Do you think that that's going to make it so you have a line out the front door to get your home sold? Guys, it's supply and demand, man, right? We all know that the more people are actually buying for your home, the more the, the better price you're going to get. You raise interest rates, you get more prop, you raise interest rates and you get more demand on the more properties on the market, it's going to stifle demand, right? So that goes into the common objection of or a rebuttal of, you know, do you want to take the 100% probability of selling your home for the most money in the quickest amount of time right now? Do you want to line out the front door? Do you want 12 offers in the next two minutes? Or do you want to gamble on the uncertainty of, of next year? We know that rates have to come up sooner or later. We know that a portion of those 32% of the people who came off the market had the same idea that you have. And then it's going to, you know, it's going to stifle or it's going to increase supply. So you have a hot rising interest rates that stifles demand and you have rising um, properties, numbers on market, that's going to give people more options. So what do you want to do? Right. But the deflection part is tying them into a lot of homeowners. Hey, look, I totally get that you want to sell it till next spring. Um, you know, a lot of homeowners are thinking that way. Now, you can also actually go into like this, you know, if you don't mind me asking, what is it that's uh, about next spring that's important to you about waiting until next spring? And they're going to answer it. And then you can kind of go into, look, um, you know, a lot of homeowners have decided to do the same thing you're doing. I don't know if you know this or not, but in our market, the number of inventory right now is down by 32%. Did you know that? Right? Notice how I, and, and those of you that know me and talk to me on a, on a like a real in-person basis, you know that I answer your question, then I ask you a question. Answer a question, ask you a question, right? That's just, you got to get into that habit because if telling is not selling, you have to understand what it is that you're, you're trying to solve, right? These, you're a salesperson and a salesperson solves problems. And the bigger problem you solve, the more money you make. So you want to make more money? Go find a big problem to solve, right? People are willing to pay money for, for, uh, for solving a problem. So that's it. We're going to wait until after spring. So we did the deflection. I tied in a softener on that. I also did this or that. There's a lot of different techniques that I put into that one. Your company doesn't sell much in our price point. Uh, and I didn't finish this right here, but it said, I doubt that you have buyers in my market area. So this is one that came up. So look, if you sell a lot of, now I'm in Southern California. Some of you guys are not in a price point that I is. The average sales price is more like 200. You know, I think the national average is like 220. Where I live, the average sales price is like 850, right? So I hope I don't sound pretentious when I actually use these numbers because I started my career in Utah and the average when I moved to California, the average commission, which means the average sales price was like five times different. So um, that was a good move for me. But anyways, your company doesn't sell much in our price point. Look, focus on what you're good at. Why are you going to walk yourself into a punch like this? If you're used to selling $300,000 homes, $500,000 homes, $800,000 homes, if you're going to go after that ultra luxury market, which in our market is north of 1.5 plus, let's say around 1.6 million is our, is the top 10% of our market. If you're, if you don't focus on that space, if you don't have a lot of experience in that space, 
expect that you're going to get this objection. You better practice it. And you better have a really, really good answer at it. Now, I'm going to give you guys an idea of how to structure it, how I would do it. But if you're going to go after that, know that you're going to get that objection and practice how you're going to rebuttal it based on your experience. Now, I have you know, more than 20 years of selling properties in all price ranges across 26 states. I've sold, sold over a thousand properties easy, right? That's where I would go. But if you're newer to the business and you don't have a whole lot of the track record, and maybe if you're with a boutique, look, I, this, the, I'm not going to be able to give you anything magical to say, right? Because it comes down to value. What you pay versus what you provide are the two variables you need to get value. And quite honestly, if you don't have a whole lot of experience in that higher price point, you're not really bringing a whole lot of value. But let's talk about that. I would hit this head on. You know what? You're right, Mr. and Mrs. Seller. Um, I specialize in selling homes in the area, not just in a specific price point. And if you don't mind me asking, are you more focused on working with an agent who does a few deals in your price range? Or are you, are you looking more for experience of someone who sells a lot of homes in your area across all price ranges? Which one are you looking for? Now, I did a technique called this or that, right? Usually, if you give someone option A and option B, they don't chore, choose you know, option C. They don't go through the third door, right? That's, but they might, right? They might. Typically, if you're dealing in the ultra luxury market, or I'm, I'm assuming that people aren't saying you don't work and sell my, much of my price point. Usually, if you're selling million dollar homes, you don't get that objection from someone who's sell, selling a $500,000 home, you know, half the price usually you don't get going to get an objection. And this might be a drunk monkey thing. This might be an objection or a situation that you're actually bringing up in your own mind. So, you know, you're worried about having this conversation, right? You're concerned about this objection coming up. Well, the only way that you can make sure that you're not worried about an objection coming up is take that objection and practice that objection, right? Cater it towards you, right? You know, you look, um, you're right. I don't, you know, my company doesn't sell a, a lot of homes in this price range. You know, would you rather have a company with a track record of selling a few homes in a specific track record? Or do you want a nationwide company that has a, a broad reach that services all price ranges uh, and experience to sell your home? You know, the key with that, this and that is to make the one option like all dingy like, it's like an infomercial, right? Um, all dingy like, like not very attractive. And then how awesome the other option is, right? So that's the thing. But the deflection is, um, I didn't go and kind of go into that, but the deflection on this would be, you know what, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Seller, a lot of homeowners with homes priced in your value uh, have a lot of the similar concerns. But let me ask you this question. You know, I, I specialize, yada, yada, yada. Okay, we don't have to kick the, kick the go over that again. So that's how I'd handle that. Um, now, here's the thing is, you know, I doubt if you're going to find a buyer in my price range, um, you know, are you looking, you know, a lot of, again, you're going to deflect it, you know, Mr. Ms. Stiller, it's a valid concern. Uh, a lot of homeowners in your price range would have a similar concern. But if you don't mind me asking, are you looking for an agent that knows how to market the, the, the property to attract the right buyer to your property? Or are you looking for someone who who maybe have sold just a few homes in your price range that doesn't really know how to mass market a property to get that demand. You know, what, what are you looking for? Right, let them answer. Now, here's the thing. I'm, the, the, the point of asking questions, the point of practicing rebuttals is not to always win. Winning is great, right? But the point here is to get them to a point of thinking about the process and then coming to an informed decision on yes or no. You're not always going to win. It's going to come down to value. And again, value comes down to price, what they pay, and what they get. You cannot determine value if you don't know those two components, right? When I'm uh, talking with real estate agents, I lose on value or uh, I lose on price all the time, all the time. I win more because I'm actually working with agents who are more aligned with my, our philosophy and what we're doing. But look, there's, there are people who are just focused more on price. It, it is what it is. You and, you and I are the same. 
What commission, uh, what commission do you charge? Okay, that's, that's a good one. Um, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, that's a really, really great question. Most homeowners are concerned with the amount of fees that are being charged. See, I deflected it, right? Most homeowners. Uh, most homeowners are uh, concerned or interested in the fees they're charged. If you don't mind me asking, is there something specific that you're looking for? Now I'm putting it back on them, right? I don't want them just to come up and say, hey, what commission do you charge? Hey, I charge 6%. Yep, no, thanks. Yeah, you don't know the context of, the, of everything, right? What is it that you're looking for? Well, you know, we've interviewed another uh, another agent. They're saying that they'll do it for, you know, 4%. 4%. Wow, that's uh, that's really low. If you don't mind me asking, who's the agent? Oh, his name's like John Doe. John Doe, you know, I don't, I don't know that name. Does he, does he work this? Does he number one work full time? And does he work this area? No, no, he doesn't work at full time. You know, he's he works at Starbucks part time. Oh, he works at Starbucks part time. Yeah, but he's the manager. Oh, yeah, he's he's the manager. That's fantastic. So you're gonna, you know, there's a whole different ways that we can kind of go down this, right? But the key is we're working on deflection. Um, you know, most homeowners tie them into that, tie them into um, that they're right and that they're in a normal line of thinking with other people within the, the same uh, space. Now let's go into the last one. I want to list the property higher than you recommend. Now, as I was struggling with this one as I was writing this, because really it just comes down to sellers, especially in this market, they want to overprice their listing. They think that by overpricing their listing, it's going to be, um, they're, they're going to get what they want, right? That's their thought process. And, you know, it's a logical thought process. Let's give them that. Um, so in my market, if I, so, so I, I had to do a general, generalized objection here, but let's say that you're in, let's just go with the average sales price in the, in the nation, like two let's call it 300,000. And you come across a seller who wants to list it at 350,000, right? So more than 10% more than what the fair market price is. So, you know, you're going to want to deflect again. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you know, most homeowners believe that by listing their home in a hot market higher than what the fair market price is, they're almost guaranteed to, to get that higher price. Is that how you feel too? right? Most homeowners who believe that by listing their price above fair market value, believe that they're going to almost certainty get that value. Are you in that same category? Are you in that same camp? Is that your belief, right? They're, they're either going to say yes or no. Most likely, if they want to do it overpriced, then they're going to be in the yes category because otherwise, them wanting to list higher, if they say no, otherwise, this whole thing doesn't make any sense. Right. And if they do say no, like, you know, that, that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me then. You know, why would you want to deliberately list a price that's overvalued when you believe, you know, otherwise? OK, we'll go back to that. Um, so I want to list the property higher than you recommend. Um, you know, Mr. Mr. You, know, you, de you deflect. And then um, if you don't mind me asking, you know, you, you, you use the buffer. Most homeowners, uh, they feel that they. Uh, in a hot market like this, that if they list higher than the fair market value, that they're going almost guaranteed to get that higher price. Are you in that same camp? Yeah, I am that same camp. Okay. Now, Mr. and Ms. Seller, do you know when the most activity of a, uh, the most showings and the most activity a property gets uh, when you list a property? Now, notice I asked the question. I didn't say, hey, did you, you know, uh, hey, Mr. and Ms. Seller, the first three weeks of the, uh, on market is the most activity, right? I'm not telling them. I'm asking them, hey, Mr. and Ms. Seller, do you know uh, the best time or the most activity that you get when listed property? No, Brett, I don't. Well, you know, what is it? It's the first three weeks. It's the very first three weeks. Once that three-week mark hit, it like drops like a rock. I mean, it makes sense to you, right? Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of buyers. It's looking for properties. So a new property comes on that's in their price range. They flock to it, right? And then all of a sudden, nothing, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, Brett, that, that makes sense. So let me ask you this other question. When you're looking to buy something, now you're going to sell this home to buy another one, right? Yeah, we're going to sell this home and buy another one. And you know what is it that you're looking for? We're looking for a four bedroom, three bath, four bedroom, three bath. Okay. And what's your price range on that? Well, we don't want to spend more than half a million. Okay. So 500,000 is your top, right? 
Okay. So if we go out and look at property and I'm showing you four bedroom, three bathrooms, now I'm assuming that they're going to work with me, right? Uh, and we go out and look at four bedroom, three bath that are priced in that 500, no more than that $500,000 range. Would you even want to go look at a house that's listed for 550,000 that's in the same neighborhood that is, um, that, that has four bedrooms and three baths? Would you, would you want to go look at that? Well, no, no, I wouldn't. Yeah. See, you're, the way that you look at things is no different than what another buyer is going to look at things, right? Now, in this hot market, if, you know, if you list a property, what we're seeing, if you list a property at fair market value, you're going to attract a lot of people and chances are um, you're going to have a bidding war. You're going to have multiple offers and it's going to bid things up. But if you list it over price, you're not even getting people through the front door. Can you see how that works? Well, yeah, I do see how this works. So, Mr. Masella, I got to ask you a question, and please don't take offense by this. Do you want to sell your property or do you just want to list your property? Guys, that's an honest question, right? You're not interested in just working with someone who wants to kick the tires and, and just want to list a property. And that's why when we go back to the fundamentals, why it's so important that you get their why and their when. Because some of them do just want to test the market. Some of them do want to just, look, if I get you know, the house is worth 500,000. I'm hearing about my neighbors and everyone who's getting all these multiple offers. You know, it's like they're selling an Apple iPhone and people are lining up around the corner. You know, they're hearing about this. So why not? Let's put it on the market for 550,000. We get 500. If, if you're going to do that, you might as well just put it up at 600,000, right? Because if you're going to get, if, if, if you're good with 550,000, you know, isn't $600,000 better? You know, so, um, so those are kind of, kind of questions you have to have. Going back to the lesson plan today, it was all about deflection. It was not being able to talk to them directly on this because if a lot of the stuff that I had said here, if you're very direct and to the point, you're talking to them mono in mono, then it's going to be an uncomfortable situation for three quarters of the personalities that you're going to have. And my God, if you're a driver personality and you're going direct to the other three quarter person, now a driver to driver those personalities, look, you guys will get something done and, and agreed upon like in two seconds. But, you know, if you're a driver personality and you're talking to 75% of the other personalities and you go direct without deflecting, um, you know, you're gonna, it, it's going to come off wrong. The delivery is going to come off wrong unless you put a lot of practice into it, right? So, date 58. So, I'm good on time. So, guys, that's what I got today. Um, start working on practicing deflections. I got some cool things that are even coming up into the group as far as training wise, um, kind of going forward. I'm going to be making some adjustments uh, to that. And uh, of course, you guys will be the first ones to know. But I hope you guys have a great Thursday. I hope, you know, get on the phone, do some prospecting. Prospecting in sales solves everything. Solves everything. So, all right, guys, that's all I got. So I hope you guys have a fantastic day. Take care. Bye-bye.